Welcome back, everybody. Now, in today's video, I want to address a very important topic. A few months ago, I got a comment to the effect of, hey, boomer, hey, old fuddy-duddy, why don't you use a code editor from this century? To which I reply, no, I'm not going to do that, and I don't think you should either. Now, in this video, I'm going to give you some reasons why you would want to use Vim and how you can get started with a fairly minimalist install of Vim that gets you up and running very, very quickly. So the first reason why you may want to use Vim is portability. So if you do any work in deep learning or artificial intelligence, you're going to have to be working from the terminal, possibly on a remote machine. Now, obviously, if you're working in a remote machine, you can't simply load up something like uh, Visual, uh, Visual Studio, uh, VS Code, excuse me, and start coding away. You're going to have to use something within the terminal. Now, Nano is an option and Nano does work, but it doesn't really give you any of the features that you would want in a code editor. It's simply a text editor and not a particularly good one at that. Second reason is that VI or Vim is a totally open source project. There is nothing funny going on in the background. You don't have a company clutching telemetry on how you use it. You don't have, you know, anything untoward going on. You can be uh, reasonably confident that it's just doing what you think it's doing and nothing more and nothing less. Now, if you're not a big privacy wonk, that isn't, you know, a particularly compelling reason. But for me, I think it's useful. Uh, I use Linux on a daily basis because I don't like all the telemetry Windows 10 collects. I thought Windows 7 was a great operating system, but they kind of jumped the shark with Windows 10. Uh, to my mind only has, you know, a very limited purpose for perhaps high-end video editing, which I don't really do, or perhaps gaming if you're really into that kind of thing. So... Uh, for me, Linux is the way to go, and coupled with that is something like Vim. So in my mind, you know, there's really no reason to use a full-function, full-featured text editor when VI does pretty much everything you're going to need, uh, albeit in a somewhat roundabout way and just not as visually appealing. So to get started with it, obviously, you have to make sure you have Vim installed. That is obviously a prerequisite. Then you're going to need something... Um, called a kind of like a package manager for Vim, uh, a plugin manager is what they call it. I use Bundle. There's a few other options. Pathogen is one I see quite frequently, but I settled on Bundle for whatever reason. So uh, here you have uh, the GitHub repo. It's open source. You know precisely what it is doing. Uh, and installation is quite simple. So quite simple, excuse me. So all you're going to do is clone uh, the code into a directory and then make a .vimrc file and copy and paste this text into it which is going to uh, basically load the bundle pl plugin manager and get you started with uh, loading other plugins that allow you to do some sort of you know Python code editing features so uh, let's start with this so what we're going to do is head to the terminal and just copy this uh, simple command and then uh, run it and then copy this text and make a vim dot excuse me dot vim rc file. So here I am in my terminal and I'm in the base directory, the root directory. I'm just going to uh, copy this simple git clone command, execute that, and that is done. And then I'm going to load up vim and edit my vim rc file. And there was that bunch of text there. I'm going to copy it, paste and then do a write to write it to the buffer. And I'm gonna get rid of a lot of this stuff. So uh, these are this is the only line for the plugins that is required. You have to load bundle. The rest of this stuff is simply um, demonstration purposes only. So I uh, just delete that and then you can write again and we can quit and we're done with uh, our package manager. It's pretty straightforward. Now we're ready to move on to some basic packages for syntax highlighting and stuff like that. So the next package we're really going to need is something to handle uh, syntax checking for Python. So you have a couple options. I've used Syntastic in the past and that works. The downside there is that it only operates on write or write quit or opening the file. So it's only periodically this package here, this plugin here, Ale is an asynchronous linting engine, meaning that it is running in real time. So as you exit the text editing mode, uh, it will flag the errors for you. So you don't have to do a write or a write quit and actually leave the file to catch your errors. So it's very useful for real time uh, debugging of syntactical, uh, grammatical, and um, 
PEP8 uh, style errors. So it's a very useful plugin. And the installation is, again, very, very simple. It has a whole other host of features I don't use. Uh, you can check it out in the documentation. Um, if you like like help bubbles and things like that, it does that. Uh, I'm not into all of that. I like very basic functionality. But if you want more modern features, it certainly supports that. So if we go to installation with Vundle, um, all we have to do is um, either way we have to clone our clone this particular repo into our local machine and then we can do uh, installation with bundles very very simple so we just copy this command and then we can uh, head back to the terminal and get started with installation so we're back in the terminal we just paste the code the command rather and let it run and then we can take a look back into our root directory and check out our vimrc file we just come down here and say plugin dense analysis slash ale and then run our plugin install command and it is done with that let's quit out of that right let's run the plugin install again i don't think it ran the didn't run the dense analysis one second let's try it again there it goes had to exit out of the the file so uh, now we have both our plugin manager and our asynchronous linting engine installed so we can quit the plugin install quit out of vim and move on to installing other stuff the next thing we're going to need is our pep style guides now if you don't really care about style i've seen some of your github repos and i know some of you do not uh, then you can skip this step I try to keep within general guidelines of PEP8, um, really everything other than the character, the line character number limitation I think is pretty reasonable. So I'll typically ignore that one, but other stuff I think is good to check yourself on. So you have to make sure you install uh, Flake 8. Let me zoom in a little bit for you guys. You have to make sure you install the Python package for Flake 8, and then we can actually install the uh, Flake 8 Vim plugin. So go ahead and do a pip install of flake 8 if you haven't done that already and then we'll go over here and worry about installing uh, the actual package and you can see once again it's very simple just cloning a github repo and then adding a line to our .vmrc file very very straightforward let's head to the terminal and get that set up so i'm going to make sure i have flake 8 installed which obviously i already do uh, then i'm going to come to the GitHub window and execute those terminal commands. And that is pretty straightforward. Then all we have to do is go back to our vimrc file and put in our plugin. So we'll say plugin. And you'll notice kind of a syntactical similarity between all of these GitHub repos. We will say nvie slash vim dash flake eight not flake nine flake eight right quit and then you can actually run i believe vim plus plugin install plus q all something like that and it installs everything and then quits so then we already now we have our uh flake eight style guides uh pretty straightforward um only thing left to do is some other additions to our vim uh, RC file so that we can have line numbering, syntax highlighting, stuff like that. So let's head into the file and go ahead and make the modifications we're going to need to really bring this up to modern text editing levels. So looking at this, you can see that most of this is kind of boilerplate type of stuff. Um, after we handle all of our package uh, plugins, we can think about um, some additional settings for Vim. So we can say something like syntax on to turn on syntax highlighting. That's going to be very, very helpful, of course, as well as enabling all of our colors. Now, by default, it doesn't have 256 colors. So we say set T CO equals, equals 256. So we have all 256 colors. Another feature you get in uh, modern text editors is code folding. Uh, so we're probably going to want that. So we'll say um, set fold method equals indent and set fold 
level equals 99. Now that fold method equals indent will enable code folding. Uh, the fold level equals 99 will enable us to actually open a file without everything folded up. Otherwise, by default, all functions, classes, etc., are folded up. That's kind of annoying. I don't like that. But fortunately, you can change it with simply one line of code in your dot file. Next, we can remap our um, code fold button. Instead of something like ZA, we can use the space bar. So we're going to say N, no remap. So a non-recursive remap of the space bar to the space bar from the command ZA. So we'll be able to press space to fold our code without having to press ZA. Now, uh, if you want to leave it at ZA, you're free to do that. I just prefer to use the flake button, the flake, excuse me, the, the space bar. Uh, next, we need to handle um, the tabbing kind of stuff. So we're going to use several lines. So we're going to say buff new file, buff read start.py. So for all of our Py files, um, we're going to say set tab stop equals four and that's going to be the max width of our tab character then we're going to set soft tab stop to four these two should be the same otherwise you're going to get some issues and then set shift width equals four that is the size of an indentation set uh, text width equals 79 i haven't i haven't experimented with this too much i uh, just kind of set it and left it then we have to set expand tab. What that does is it turns tabs into spaces. Very important so that you don't get a mixture of tabs and spaces error when you load up a file. That's a big pain. That's hard to track down. Mm -hmm. Then we can set auto indent and set our file format. Set file, excuse me, we need our backslash set file format equals Unix. And you want to do that because Unix and Windows um, use a different end of line character and you get uh, some pretty interesting bugs. So in particular, if you are committing to a GitHub repo where you've used Windows style uh, new line characters and the repo uses um, Unix style new line characters, when you go to do a merge, you're going to get an error on every single line because your new line character does not match up. That's a pretty big problem. Ask me how I know that is definitely a mistake I have made. Next, we can say let GAL linters. We want to specify the linter for our asynchronous lint engines. We want to let it know that for Python, we're going to be using flake eight. And we want to set our line numbers finally. So we actually get line numbers. Uh, you can actually use relative number if you want to turn on relative numbering where it'll display um, how many lines above or below your cursor position each line is. I'm not a big fan of that. Some people are, but it's something you can use, experiment with if it's something you like. So then we can write quit. Then when we open it back up, you see that we now have our line numbers. Okay, so let's write quit out of that. Now, the last thing we really want to worry about for a minimalist install is a color scheme. Um, there are several. I use the solarized type schemes. I kind of like the way it looks. That's very personal. Obviously, there is no right choice there. So let's go back to our um, GitHub repos and see what our options are like. Okay, so our last step is color management. Obviously, the default color scheme isn't too pleasing on the eye, and it's something that's very personal. Everybody has their own preferences. So how do you go about setting up your own particular color scheme? So the basic idea is that all this stuff is going to live in a GitHub repo. And just like with our plugins, we're going to copy the, we're going to clone the GitHub repo to our local machine. Uh, but in this case, we're going to move this colors subdirectory to a colors subdirectory in our .vim uh, folder, and then uh, make a simple modification to our .vim RC file. I found a couple uh, that seemed reasonable. Zenburn is one option. Colors Solarized is another option. The one I settled on is Vim Atom Dark. I like that one the most. Uh, that's what I use in my videos. If you want to copy my look, feel free. Otherwise, you know, the sky's limit, come up with your own stuff. So what you want to do is uh, copy the code here to do a git clone and then go back to your terminal. And I've already done the git clone. So it clones this into Vim Atom Dark. So if you do a list on that, Vim Atom Dark, you'll see we have a colors subdirectory so we can 
cd into our dot vim do a list a make make dir on colors so we can have our colors subdirectory and then we're going to copy uh, from our root directory vim adam darks colors star into this directory oh i didn't mean to do that so move star dot vim into colors i meant to copy it oh, into the into the uh, colors subdirectory so then cd colors and you can see we have adam dark 256 and adam dark so now of course we have to handle modifying our vim rc file so we can actually set up our color scheme so if we just come down here where we say set tco equals 256 i'll just add it in right here we'll say um we already have our syntax on so i'll say color scheme Hopefully I spelled that correctly, Adam Dark 256. So then if I right quit and then open up my Vim, now you can see that it has a totally different look and you can experiment with whatever different types of colors you want. So now let's go take a look at a simple Python file and see how our actual linting works. So here we are in the subdirectory for the Prioritize Experience Replay course up on my platform, shameless plug, link in the description, get access to all of my courses for a low monthly fee. So if we take a look at our test max heap, you can see we have uh, actual syntax highlighting. Let's do something stupid like just have a def command and you can see that it immediately flags invalid syntax on this particular line. Uh, you get the indicator in the left that tells you which line it's on. And then also you get E302, expected two blank lines found one. This is from your PEP8 style guide. Um, that just helps keep your style consistent so that you don't clutter up your files. But it does uh, syntax error highlighting straight, straight off the bat. You don't have to do any file exiting or anything like that. So then you can delete the line, and of course it's going to give you an, uh, an error where it's too many blank lines, it only wants two, so get rid of a couple of those, and you are basically done with, um, with fixing up your file. So this is just a very basic demonstration of a very minimalist uh, install of Vim as a um, Python editor. Uh, you can see it's incredibly lightweight. It loads up instantly. It consumes almost no RAM. It can be used on nearly any system. So if you have to do an SSH into a remote Linux server, uh, you're going to be able to run Vim. And you, if you have access to the internet, you can even do a git clone on your dot files to get your very own setup. Uh, it's very, very straightforward. And it's, you know, really the the, I don't know, kind of kind of old school, but uh, really, in my opinion, a better way of handling code editing. So I hope that was helpful for you. Hopefully it gave you some inkling of uh, desire to start with Vim. Uh, be aware there is a steep learning curve, but once you get over that, it is incredibly worth it. And I haven't even tapped into, you know, 5% of the power of this particular text editor. So I hope that all that was helpful for you. Uh, comment suggestions. If you still think I'm a stupid boomer, leave a quite, uh, leave a negative comment down below. I'll read it. Uh, I'll probably give you a heart because I, you know, I don't, I don't like to spread negativity. But you're free to speak your mind on this channel, and I will see you in the next video.